Well, we will get going then. I am recording for audio. And I am recording video. All right. Turbines to speed. <laughs> You know, you could come back with me. We could be friends. I promise not to let you... Uh, I gotta start over. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You know, you could come back with me. We could be friends. I promise not to let my big sister dissect you. I'm Anthony. I'm David. I'm Kirby. I'm Katie. And I'm Jim. Welcome to issue number 166 of the Crimson Cowl Comic Club Podcast. Each and every week, we meet here to talk about comic books. On this week's issue, we've got a club discussion for issue number five of Inkblot. Uh, next week, we will do crossover issue number three. And then in a couple weeks, I think in a week, we have uh, Batman Adventures Continue number eight. The finale comes out so maybe in about two weeks on that one or so. Uh, we will do weekly reviews on this show, which will go around the internet, talk about the books that we've been reading, both new and old. This week's letter page, here is the question we will discuss later on. Pick a comic book character you never had much interest in, but assign the writer and an artist that would get you to read their series. So uh, think about that. We will talk about that later mm. in the show. And uh, but first, we're going to start off with the club discussion for Inkblot issue number five. The mysterious cat wanders further backwards in time into an ancient jungle. Ten young sorcerers make camp, but the youngest of the group wanders off in search of a cute little cat. All right, we have Emma Kubert and Rusty Glad doing the writing and the art, they're doing everything on this book. Uh, we've uh, talked about this one for uh, this will be the fifth month obviously and uh, we've all really enjoyed it we've got a fun fantasy series about a, a cat who is created out of an inkwell being spilled onto the floor and this cat and jumping into portals and all these different realms and causing a bunch of you know possibly leading to a bunch of mischief and uh, possibly saving the day in some scenarios uh, but basically just keeping the characters on a run and uh, what we started to discover is this is a time traveling cat as well, going back in time uh, between these different realms, all surrounded around this uh, family, uh, which we met in the first issue, which they uh, kind of cover all of these different realms. Everybody in this family has a different job. And our narrator, who is the, uh, the bookworm, uh, is the one that has been for uh, a thousand years or more, um, has been uh writing these stories and and uh putting them down into the library and telling their tales and uh this particular issue jumps back in time as we see uh the family uh uh at a much younger time i guess uh age wise you know some of them are a little younger um but they're all sitting there with the campsite we obviously have our cat appearance that kind of wanders off that leaves the uh one of the uh, the siblings, uh, Enos. Is that maybe how you say the name? Enos, sure. Enos, Enos from Dukes of Hazard. Um, as uh, he kind of wanders off to chase for the cat, which uh, then leads leads to the hijinks of the issue. And once again, seeing uh, the older brother uh, who we've seen in the past issues that are kind of taking charge and uh, trying to protect the family and 
stuff like that. So that is the overall idea of this issue. So what we'll do here, uh, just kind of dive into it and uh, all kind of talk about it. Um, so yeah, the opening scene, the campfire, we see some of the siblings kind of bickering and fighting, calling each other witches and stuff like that. Uh, but we see, uh, I thought it was kind of funny with the bookworm sitting there with the pile, the pile of books, uh, which is just kind of funny around like, you know, a campfire type of uh, scene, you know, still just kind of left to uh, record uh, all of these stories and journeys of these characters. Anybody want to jump in with the opening uh, moments, kind of talk about? I the... do. Yep. Yep. So there was a panel that I thought was really funny and it says, excuse, excuse yourselves. I'm trying to proofread. And I chuckled at that because I have been doing a bunch of proofreading the past two weeks. Um, and th there have been some moments where I have wanted to say, um, excuse me, I am trying to proofread. So that was funny. Good, good, good little joke. Appreciate that. Yeah, that one really hit close to home, huh? Yeah, it has. Proofreading can be hard work. Oh, my goodness. And hopefully, but we'll cover it later with all the stuff that happens in the end of the issues. Uh, hopefully, you didn't relate to any of that kind of stuff that happened. That no. Would... Okay. Yeah, no, all good. I, I did not have any magic teleporting cats or anything like that. I, I was just me and my laptop, so. Well, the yeah. magic teleporting cat would have made it much more fun. Yeah, that's true, actually. It would have been, yeah. Go from a dry, very heavy technical document to a teleporting cat. Okay, I am I am on board. Let's go. But yeah, while uh, I did like the exchange between uh, two of the people here when they're saying uh, after calling the witch and Prissy and all that kind of stuff, uh, snob, Prissy little snob, um, I like the take it back, take a bath. And uh, yeah, just kind of <laughs> mentioning about the, the one that uh, fairly has not bathed in a while, according to uh, the sister. It sounds like si siblings. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that leads into the scene where the, the young sibling, the, uh, the younger brother of uh, our bookworm character, kind of goes off and uh, thought they saw this cat, finds the cat up in the tree, uh, tries to, to claim it. Says the opening line here that I s introduced the podcast with, you know, uh, you could come back with me. We could be friends. I promise not to let my big sister dissect you. Now, what was fun about this with kind of revisiting this family, I went back to kind of skim through issue one, and there is a scene right away when the, the cat has formed and the, the bookworm is kind of trying to catch it. You know, there is that line where the sister, she goes, you know, something about like, I will dissect you. So that is a callback to something that I guess in the time frame, her older self would say, I don't know. Is that kind of what's happening? I assume we're, we've gone back in time to, you know, there there's, you know, thousands of years old, but uh, you know, they're maybe just a tad younger here. But yeah, so that was a callback to issue number one right there. Um, our next scene, we can kind of, yep. Apparently they age very slowly then. Yeah, and uh, in the next scene here, we've got uh, as kind of catches up with our uh, ink blot cat. Uh, that's when the young boy sees a bunch of fairies and crazy looking dragon seagull birds things, pelican birds. Uh, then we've got uh, some goblins and a unicorn and a bunch of different creatures into uh, what leads eventually into a crazy uh, splash page but we have a giant rock monster basically comes in and threatens the scene uh, so yeah we get a lot of action a lot of uh, stuff that uh, this creative team is very good at when it comes to these fantasy pages of just there's a lot going on but it's all just so so good looking and so intriguing any comments on this scene at all well i was just really intrigued by this creature they called the guardian which was like a giant cat with a raccoon tail mm. and uh, rabbit ears and antlers and three eyes. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, yeah, and everything when yeah, you you know with the guardian and stuff, you know, just, while they may be scary uh, at first and they're all kind of popping up, but ultimately, uh, you know, the kids uh, pretty excited and wants to share with the family and stuff, but it's not until 
this giant rock monster shows up on this page here and uh, that's when things kind of maybe get a little scary for everybody and uh, it's time for the uh, the eldest uh, the one who maybe eventually is king or is king now um, was it Zinthia or something his name is I forget it's X something yeah I forget the yeah, exact they have, it at the, they have it close to the beginning of the book but yeah we see uh, that Zemphos. character Okay, we see that character kind of jump in as uh, the giant splash page I was talking about here is uh, rock monsters kind of scaring everybody off. But we get our leader, we get our king that comes in with that uh, magical stick that we saw back in the the Sphinx issue, which was that last month's, I think. I think that was the yep. last one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, basically uh, kind of settling the situation going in and attacking the rock monster and uh, breaking him down and we think everything's going to be fine but uh then uh, a bunch of little rock monsters kind of form from it so we've got a pile of these guys so the, the one giant it's it's a reverse megazord in a way um is uh, a good way to explain it <laughs> yeah um, but yeah so uh but yeah now there's a bunch of them maybe it's a critters type of thing too um um but yeah, that kind of leads to uh, uh, more panic as our young boy here kind of runs off and uh, I Inos, Enos is told to run off and basically is kind of uh, screaming and it's a possible connection with the cat. The cat's kind of wrapped around him. So do we have any theories on does this kid have these abilities or is it just a combination of everything going on or... Well, I thought that was really interesting and definitely a really cool splash page. I'd love to see more about this. I interpreted it as the kid has these abilities, but your question of does the cat have an involvement, I think is really uh, good to explore. And I like that perspective. Um, it reminded me of series abilities from The Witcher. So that was kind of cool. But no, you pose a really good question. I'd love to hear what everyone else thinks about it. Yeah, his eyes are glowing. Uh, the stick is still kind of glowing in the big explosion thing. You know, the cat just seems kind of shocked and, you know, hair standing up uh, around as he's kind of wrapped around the boy's neck yet. But maybe there's some sort of, uh, you know, some kind of doing with the cat. But, yeah, maybe this is the unlocking of the powers as well. So, um but yeah, he casts a spell and he saved uh, the family, saved the, the king, and basically is kind of left to uh, keep the cat in the little boy's protection in, a, in the little uh, bag there as they want to return to camp and basically uh, kind of tell, tell everybody and they have to, uh, hold on, there's something they got to keep hidden from Bookworm. Oh yeah, there we go. We go back to that line again where uh, um, the little boy says he's going to keep the cat safe. But then uh, his older brother's like, I keep it, I'd keep it hidden uh, from bookworm. She'd probably try to dissect it, dissect it. And he's like, that's exactly what I thought. So everybody <laughs> in this family knows how the bookworm. <laughs> maybe it's a, it's an ongoing trait, and you know, maybe there's certain buttons that you don't want to push with her that it just leads her to dissecting things. Maybe, maybe something tragic has happened in the past, or she's just threatened people with that multiple times so but yeah um that was another entertaining issue and uh just kind of learning a little more about the family here the more a little more internal adventure with the last couple issues some of the other ones kind of went into the different realms and things like that and but it seems like there's still the kind of general focus of uh following the uh this family here and kind of learning now more about the time travel any thoughts overall on issue five that we haven't talked about um i'm enjoying that this is kind of more of a continuing story rather than a collection of one shots um it's going to make me want to keep going with it a little bit more doing it if since they're doing it that way um and i i'm thinking that the power came from the boy not the cat because the cat jumped away if the cat had, I'm thinking if a cat had caused, had been the source of the power that did that, the cat would have stayed there. But the cat jumped to the bigger brother. So that's my opinion on that one, though. So. 
and most likely we will uh, explore that uh, further in the future. Yep. Now, uh, Katie had mentioned in last week's episode, I believe, about the trade paperback coming out uh, pre-order in uh, March, I assume. Uh, was that collecting the first five issues? Do we know if we're taking a break here for them to do their first trade, you know, you know, a month or two break? Um, I believe it was issue one through six. Okay. Uh, I, I do not know if they're going on. I haven't have not noticed that Emma has said that or not. So I guess we'll have to find out. Okay. Um, but cause... she appears to be working every day if, you know, what she's posting is current to, you know, her day-to-day -day life. She's doing something every single day. She's a, she's put in, put in a lot of time in. Yeah, and that's what I was going to... Okay, so we do have an ink block in ink blot six in February. So my guess they'll take a month, if not a two months off, once they have the trade come out. Um, so that was going to be something I was going to propose to the people here, because um, a lot of times we'll cover things that uh, you know that it kind of has a you know an arc or a, you know a, a conclusion. This is a series that I'm going to keep reading, and I assume with the other ones too. So I guess it's all up to us if we we're going to continue to do that as a club discussion. Uh, at least until we find some other things too, but I'm open for whatever, uh, assuming, you know, it will continue, but issue six might have some sort of, you know, chapter closure, I would assume before they launch into a new direction. But yeah, we'll, we'll find that out once it comes and uh, kind of see where we're all sitting, but um, any other uh, closing thoughts at all before issue five, before we, uh, jump into a different portal into a different segment of the show yeah for me i just love that you could almost story without like writing like the pictures are so evocative and so expressive um i think that's really cool and i like that they're taking the visual first approach to comics and i find it a very interesting um technique to to follow and see how it works so um and so far i think it has worked because this is a wonderfully done book very beautiful to look at very colorful um and the, the the visuals and the words work in harmony together but the visuals definitely stand out and make it a, a a one to pick up yeah which goes back to their you know quote unquote marvel method for this that you can read in the back of uh the issues kind of talking about you know really setting up the those art pages and uh, kind of going in with the words afterwards beyond you know having a you know your 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 plot synopsis if you if you will but yeah that really shows that you know coming from you know artists that uh that's taking the heavier pen if you will if that's a good metaphor that maybe the the art pen is heavier than the keyboard i don't know <laughs> yeah check it out to me i'm with you but both are great as we said so mm -hmm. I just looked up Inkblot number six on Midtown, and they do not have any issues listed as future from that. So, okay. So, my, my guess, I'm assuming this still is an ongoing. I'm just guessing that it'll probably be kind of what a lot of independent series will do, where they'll take a little break yes. in between yeah. arcs, gain a bunch of new fans. I think Katie mentioned this was what going to be one of the $10 trades for the image yep. first trades, I think. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that'll definitely, you know, get people caught up. And then once the further issues hopefully will come out, it seems like we're all on board. So cool, cool. All right. If there is nothing else, then we will move on to the next segment. All right. Courtesy save there. We're good to go. Courtesy flush. <laughs> yep. I was going to say, I always do a courtesy flush and a courtesy save and just kind of cover all ground. So, all right. <clears throat> there we go. Order. Uh, what's Same. that? Uh, yep. Normal order. order. This one. Yep. Okay. 
Welcome to the weekly review section. We're going to go all the way around this internet Zoom, talk about the comics that we've been reading, both new and old. Um, this one is both new and old in the sake that it's in the, the newer Ultimate collections. It did come out a couple years ago, but this is collecting uh, comics from the 1980s. This is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the Ultimate Collection, volume number one from IDW. This is uh, collecting the Eastman and Laird original Ninja Turtle comics uh, from Mirage Studios. Issues one through seven includes the Raphael micro series one shot, and it has commentary by Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird and more. Um, so I talked about a version of this uh, a couple months back. I think last summer, myself and Damon here on the podcast have been talking about Ninja Turtles, been talking about, you know, the new series that the current series rather that we've been reading. He's been diving into the beginnings of that one through those uh, hard covers as well that look like the, uh, the different pizza boxes and stuff with the different turtles. But I wanted to take, take a trip in time, you know, turtles in time, if you will, and uh, go back to where it all started. So this expands on what I talked about a couple months ago, which I think was the first three issues uh, presented in black and white format. Uh, this is where the turtles started, but what is awesome with this is is getting all the commentary. So uh, Eastman and Laird, uh, mostly uh, Kevin Eastman doing it, but uh, Peter Laird does chime in from time to time. After every single issue of this uh, comic, um, you get uh, commentary for each page. I'm just showing off a couple of the, the splash page art to see the original uh, contributions here to this to this series but uh they'll go into details for all of the panels and uh talking about what what went into those thoughts maybe little easter eggs and maybe cameos uh because they themselves were drawn in as cameos and sometimes they had friends that were news reporters and stuff like that so there's so much that you get a uh, little history here's an example of some of that so you get a couple pages of text after each individual issue. Uh, this turtle series is covering the origin of the turtles. It is uh, talking about the, the battle against Shredder. Uh, the fact that Shredder was defeated in the first issue because Eastman and Laird had no idea that they would be doing anything more than that. And the success of the turtles all came from the fact that um, Peter Laird uh, was working for like a comics, uh, magazine i'm trying to think what the, the title was called at the moment uh, but he was working for uh, a comics magazine and uh, young kevin eastman got off from his pizza job got on the bus sat down and there was this comic magazine that was sitting on the um on the bus uh bus seat and he's like well i got a you know a ways to go home here so i'm going to uh see what what's going on and he discovered Peter Laird's uh, comic magazine, which is a collection of mini comics. And he had a dream of making comics himself. He basically reached out to Peter, uh, befriended him. And within a couple of months, uh, they were you know, best friends and working out and uh, working on comics and drawing together. And as David was showing off, uh, Kevin Eastman, they were just kind of sitting there and Kevin just goes, oh, hey, look at this. I drew something like what is it he's like oh it's an it's it's a ninja turtle and he's like well that's stupid <laughs> and then uh peter laird would return back and he'd just be like all right well here's a ninja turtle as well and then kevin's like well i have to top this so he's like i'm gonna draw four of them he's like all right here's four ninja turtles and uh and within three to five years they would have a series that just kept outselling itself issue by issue by the eighth issue, I think it was outselling Avengers. This is the mid eighties. Uh, they were getting options for toy lines and the animated series. All of this stuff was blowing up. And uh, basically they uh, were working full times for themselves, Mirage Studios in you know one of their apartments. And uh, they called it Mirage because it was kind of a mirage in itself. The fact that it wasn't an actual studio, it was just them in their apartment. And uh, and this turtle success, as you know, we are still talking about today, where it spawned uh, live action movies, CGI movies, and so many different iterations of cartoons, toy lines, everything you can imagine. And it all came from that simple sketch of a guy who happened to sit on a bus 
uh, seat. And the guy before him, if he wouldn't have left his comic magazine there, um, Kevin wouldn't have found it and led him to Peter and then led him to the turtles. Uh, so all of that history is all kind of uh, presented in this uh, first volume. They've done six volumes total. So I'm going through and uh, uh, reading all of the stories proper. Um, I won't dive into some of the future ones too much here, but uh, more so just talking about the idea of the collection of it. And it was so entertaining to kind of see where this is all born. And uh, I came into the Turtles through the animated cartoon, the, the original 80s series. I had a couple of the issues that uh, I had gotten through like rum and sales and stuff like that. But uh, so I'm happy to have been a Turtle fan for quite some time, but now I'm properly going in and seeing where it all began. So that is um, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the ultimate collection, volume one from IDW. Turtle um, I, I was curious um, because what I've got here is not that collection. Um, I have the first issue. It's actually the, uh, uh, the fourth printing because what they did is they did very small printings like the first printing and then they they upped it quite a bit by the second one which was still really a small printing and then more and more and like each printing got to be uh very big which they actually discuss in the the inside of the front cover here they kind of talk about how many uh runs they did um, yeah it started with them basically borrowing right? money from a family like an uncle or something and just getting enough to print you know i think it was like I don't know if it was like 3,000 copies. Or yeah, 2, it was. It was 3,000 3, copies at first. And then, uh, uh, let's see. Basically, by like issue eight, I think they were like, I don't know if they were up to like 75,000 copies or like even into the hundred thousands, maybe. They were, uh, the, the success, it was one of those things like, you know, you'll, you don't see that too often. You'll see big sales for no, issue number one. You know modern comics and stuff too but then you'll see a big drop off because everyone wants the first issue and this and that and uh but for like the turtles it was just kind of so bizarre that it was just kind of breaking these records and the fact that every issue you know even eight issues in was just like people are still liking this right the, the first issue when they did the three thousand, they thought they were over over buying they thought they were going to have all these left over they were kicking themselves for not keeping more of the original yeah. run um because all of a sudden it's like oh now it's selling for 25 dollars you know just within a matter of a month or two you know um the, the thing shot up and i'm sure now it's I, I don't even know what it is right now um quite a bit more i would imagine yeah 26 dollars um, so i don't know like this this one's got all these extras in the back and i don't know if that was in the original or just this printing i don't know if they included the same ones in that collection you know they've got uh you know stuff like this where the original yeah. character designs and everything yeah i've got some of that here but yeah I'm, I'm assuming for at least probably the first two printings they probably just printed the story and then maybe now you said the fourth one you know they're just like well let's give them a reason to buy a fourth one too because you'll have that too if you're a big fan of it even if you got it you'd be like I want that third printing too. And, and if you start throwing in bonuses like that, you're only going to get them to come back, you know, and quadruple dip, if you will. Right. And Shredder, uh, Shredder looks like he was taken over by Starro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, I, uh, there was a turtle power documentary too, that both Eastman and Laird are a part of, and there's a bunch of fans and stuff. And it is such a, if you're just, even if you aren't a huge Turtles fan, it's such a such an interesting story how this was done. And uh, yeah, Turtle Power, I got the DVD off of Amazon. I think you can rent it online and stuff too. And it's just so, I'm so interested in, you know, two guys who just want to make comics and, you know, they just <laughs> made these dumb little sketches and and that was their retirement plan. So I, I if I made a comic, even if it was great, I, I don't know how I would go about selling 3,000 copies of it, you know. Yeah, and yeah, so Turtles, um, I, I like Turtles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
All right. Uh, we're going to move on to the next one, which uh, David. Uh, yeah. So again, this week, I'm still on my uh, amalgam run. I was hoping that Eric would have been present uh, today because um, first up is one that I don't know if he's ever read this. Uh, it'd be interesting to see what his thoughts were on it. It is uh, Bullets and Bracelets, where essentially it's uh, a Punisher Wonder Woman team up. Granted, Punisher is a uh, mixture of Steve Trevor and Frank Castle, but he is really Frank Castle. You know, they just <laughs> colored his hair yellow and they call him uh, like Trevor Castle, I think is his name in there. Uh, Wonder, Wonder Woman, it, it, it's a mix of uh, Wonder Woman and um, Wonder Woman. Yeah, they didn't even try with Wonder Woman. There's, it's, it's really just, it's Wonder Woman. So, um, so the story starts out right from the get-go with them teaming up. This comic is sort of, uh, unlike a lot of the other ones, this one is is meant to sort of like pretend to be a one shot um where if you, you had two characters that um have their own comics that don't really exist you know um and the story here is that they had actually been married they had a kid together they're separated and now um their kid has gone missing uh the, the baby is gone and so they're, they're forced to team up to find their son. And so they go, you know, go through and they're killing off bad guys and stuff like that. You get a little background from them, um, which you do see uh, what this universe's version of Storm is. Um, and you find out, and I don't even think that I have the, the comic um, with her in it, but um it in basically storm is wonder woman in the uh the amalgam universe diana didn't actually you know get that that title and and everything else although she did go off to man's world and whatever when she found uh you know um trevor castle who had been uh wounded in vietnam and, and stuff like that and um, but they, they give you those little flashbacks there, you know, they kind of go through their life together and they're, uh, they're finding each other and falling in love and getting married and having a, a baby and then things not working out. Um, cause it's like, you know, the two of them, they're, they're not really people that, you know, you can see like living the, the whole domestic life. Um, but yeah, you, you get their their version of uh, um, of War Machine in here, which is Monarch. No explanation for that, really. He just kind of shows up and lets them know that um, you know where where their child went, and opens up a boom tube to send them to go uh, to go get the baby. And you find out that. Uh, it's been taken by some of the, the new as gods uh, because of that amalgam, uh, the, the, the amalgam. Uh, that's universe. one S and as gods? Yeah, yes, they're not the as gods, the as gods. Okay. Um, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but it is a, a, a blending of, um, you know, all the, the various Thor type characters with um, the new gods characters. Um, in fact, there is, and I will talk about it. I've already read it, but I'll hold off on next week to talk about it. Uh, Thor Ryan of the, the new as gods. Um, he's actually mentioned because, and I found this interesting. I hadn't read this before, but they, they discussed something that um, readers of, doomsday clock might recognize the term they talk about something that happened called uh the uh, secret crisis 
Now that was also in Doomsday Clock. That's what they called the upcoming, you know, when they were kind of hinting that there would be this upcoming crossover between um, Marvel and DC, which everybody is like really hoping that we would get, um, but we probably won't. But it had the same name as, as what they called this, which was also kind of like the, the merging of Secret Wars and any of the various crisis uh, crossovers in DC. Um, and so uh, Orion or Thorion or whatever he was called originally is, is killed and that's mentioned, but they find that Thanicide uh, is actually behind this and, and has abducted it. And, um, you know, the, the Punisher character actually breaks into the, uh, essentially the grave of Thorion because he had been killed off um, in the secret crisis and steals his equipment to go and, and fight Thanoside. It'd be funny when they showed Thanoside if it was just dark side, but no Thanos features. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but it really is i mean it's and, and characters like that are easy to mix because they you know they're basically the one same. really did copy the other character so you know when you get something like that um you know not not all of the mixtures are, are quite that expected this one is um now you, you could have done you know definitely like a uh, uh, Deadpool and Deathstroke mixture, but they want a different route. And I'll get into that when I talk about my next book. Ooh, tease. So this is a one shot and it kind of ends up where they, uh, they, they find their child and you see what happens to it. Um, there, there is some Omega beam shenanigans that goes on in there. And, you know, now this, this ex couple, had been kind of fighting and whatever, but um, but at least you know it does seem to have a uh, happy ending for them. Um, now, what what that means for the future, I don't know, and it doesn't matter because essentially, this is all you get. But um, one thing, yeah, I talked about some of the creative uh, teams on these books, but what I hadn't really thought to mention um, when I've talked about these in the past is. Some of these were actually published by Marvel and some of them were published by DC rather than being completely like published by Marvel and DC. So this one here, for example, is actually published by Marvel um, and it has a lot of DC like elements to it. So sometimes you can't tell just by reading the comic book, you know, who, who did it. Um, so and, and the characters are actually referred to as Diana Prince and the Punisher in, uh, in this one here. Um, but it was written by Jolton John Ostrander. Uh, inker was Killer Cam Smith. Gary All Meet Frank was the penciler. <laughs> and they, they go through the thing. And it's one of those comics where they, they add the, the various things to him. But this is a Marvel thing, yeah. This was a Marvel version of the, uh, of the book. Um, so what this one doesn't have is kind of the fake letters page, which a lot of them have. But again, um, this one is meant to be kind of a, a one shot as opposed to the other ones that were sort of these mock number one of an ongoing issue. So anyways, that's uh, Bullets and Bracelets. And uh, I still wish that Eric were here so I could check with him and see what his opinion was of this, if he'd ever read it. And if not, why not? Because it is, it's a Punisher thing. It really yeah, is. It should be in his collection if he, if he knows what's good for him. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Uh, we are going to move on to uh, the next one here. Uh, Kirby. Yeah. I checked out something that Michael Allred and Rachel Pollack discussed and decided to make while they were rolling around on psychedelics in a flowery field. It's called The Geek. And on this, if you go back into it a little bit, I want to go into a later appearance coming into this one. It's 
in Neil Gaiman's story, Brother Power, who is also known as, who is the geek apparently in the earlier comics, is revealed to be an imperfect elemental similar to the Swamp Thing. And he is connected to all human simul simulacra, <laughs> such as dolls, dummies, statues, etc. He can talk to them. They're always talking to him when he's wandering around doing things. The story resumes with the rockets returned to Earth, guided into Tampa Bay by a firestorm after an unsuccessful attempt to destroy it. His newfound ability to change his size at will leads to a call to Batman, who defers to Abigail Cable. Ultimately, a former hippie named Chester is able to calm him down. Pollock's story, which is this one, featured a brief return of Brother Power's adversary, Lord Slider Rule, now in a business suit and depicted brother power being forced to perform as a circus geek eating live animals for the first time eventually after more misadventures with the establishment he is reunited with cindy the hippie who gave him his face who is now a prostitute and is destroyed in his original form while saving her life however he ultimately survives by possessing one of her dolls and if you don't know much about him brother power the geek was a store manne mannequin who became animated in a mary shelley frankenstein style where he was struck by a bolt of lightning this also imbued him with superhuman abilities he travels the world having psychedelic counterculture misadventures and that was in the late 60s when they started him he made appearances in swamp thing and some other books throughout the years from DC, just small appearances and stuff. But this is a very, very trippy, wild adventure through. Uh, it's, it's a, it plays with your head a lot with all the little different dolls and mannequins and toys and all that stuff talking to them. And it's, it's a very fun run. I I'd never heard about this character before. I bought it, of course, because uh, Michael Allred being part of it. So I'm like, I got to check this out. And I fell in love with it and want more of it. Apparently, there's not much new stuff out there about it. But I'm going to have to go back and see what, like, the Swamp Thing appearance and stuff like that. I never, I don't remember ever reading that. That was the annual number five. So I may have that, but I'm going to have to go back and look into those. But. Yeah, this is the, the circus characters are just cruel to him, just abuse him. And this guy that's running the whole thing, the, his name's Dr. Abuse. He wants to burn down this tree that the geek has a connection to that apparently had has a bunch of dolls hanging from it and all that type of stuff. But yeah, that was a. Another fun and interesting all red item that I came across that I knew nothing about. I know, Anthony, you're going to pull out 15 comics that are related to it that I don't have. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm on the same page as you where I just got the one there. So, Oh, okay. I figured for sure you'd have the Swamp Thing one. But, yeah, not that I know of. That's, uh, that's news to me. So, well, Annual number five from 1989. So, I wonder but, yeah. if that, that would have probably, I don't know if that would have been an Alan Moore's run or where that falls. But I don't know. It maybe says I do it was reprinted in Neil Gaiman's Midnight Days, and then it, in a well, then this vertical one shot. It's possible it's sitting right down here, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, we got that. And then the other thing I can just talk about separately, I guess, and uh, just to do some more filling. So. Okay. And uh, while you brought up the topic of Michael Allred, uh, we'll cut to a commercial here for the trade paperback of X Ray Robot, which. Uh, <laughs> as the first four issues of four of uh, the X-Ray Robot series. So it is now available in paperback form, wherever you get your perfect comic books, uh, because this is one of them. X-Ray Robot, trade paperback. But no, that's got me thinking, maybe I should pick up the geek and check into that. I, I'm thinking maybe I'm some sort of an elemental. I mean, my action figures are always talking to me. So <laughs> what's that, Optimus? Oh, yes. uh, Prime thinks that I should keep that to myself. 
All right, let's roll out of this conversation and go into our Jedi Ambassador Katie for our next title. All right, thank you. Yep, new semester at the Jedi Temple. Let's go. All right, this week I have another epic collection. It is Tales of the Jedi, Volume 1. Um, uh, so Tales of the Jedi is a well-known line. This actually starts with the Dawn of the Jedi series. There were three mini-series under the Dawn of the Jedi banner. It includes Force Storm, Prisoner of Bogan, and Force War, and then some encyclopedia material. Um, I was very excited for this uh, epic collection because I have wanted to read the Dawn of the Jedi stories for like three years now. Um, so I was very happy to see them all collected in one. That was fun. Um, something that I love about this book is the artwork is absolutely gorgeous. It is it's one of the best drawn Star Wars comics I think I've seen in a long time. So I really appreciated that. That was very cool. Um, I would say that the last uh, story in this collection is a little more R-rated than we usually get from Star Wars. It's, it's very violent. Um, so just uh, consider if that's right for you. But it is called Force War. So they are leading into the war part. All right. In the Dawn of the Jedi is set like 25,000 plus years before A New Hope. So you won't see anyone named Skywalker in this. So this is actually all new. And I think that's where this shines, is we get new interpretation, understanding of the Force, the dark side, the light side. We get to learn about the ancient Jedi, um, who look very different and act very different from the Jedi that we're used to seeing. So that was very cool. Um, the planet Typhon, which is now reaching larger audiences from the Mandalorian, features heavily in here. Um, so that's cool. Uh, General premise is on the planet Tython, there are a bunch of Jedi temples and they sense a disturbance in the force. And this disturbance is the form of a man named Zesh. Zesh is a force hound. He is a, a, an enslaved assassin for the bad guys and the bad guys are the Rakatans. So if you've played the old Republic video games, um, you have seen the Rakatans and now we get to see them in all their ugly brutal, awful glory, because they are very bad guys. Um, the first adventure, Force Storm, is a group of Jedi Rangers are tracking down this individual, this anomaly. That one reminded me a lot of a Dungeons and Dragons adventure, because um, there were giant flying monsters and crawling through caves. So that was very cool. Um, they the, find the anomaly, his name is Zesh, and they eventually convince Zesh to go with them and become part of the Jedi. In Prisoner of Bogon, um, th there had been a, a previous conflict like five, ten years prior, and one of the uh, figures from that war is exiled to the planet Bogon. Bogon is a planet that is steeped in the dark side, um, and that's kind of where they, they put all their people that are, like we would put them in prison, but they just do things differently. So Zesh ends up going to Bogon and meets this guy. Um, who is referred to as the prisoner of Bogan throughout the book. And the prisoner has had a vision. And he sees a vision of war and terrible armies coming, and he is caught up into all of that. And they go throughout the system and try to convince people that we have to prepare for this terrible war. Um, and then eventually the Jedi Council decides that they're going to listen um, because some of their own seers have had visions of this war. And then, of course, uh, if a gun is presented, it must be fired. We have Force War, not one through five, which is the Jedi fight the Rakatans and their empire. And Zesh plays a big part in that of whose side will he end up taking. Um, like I said, I've been very excited to read these stories for a long time, so I really liked them. They don't feel like the Star Wars we're used to seeing, so that could be a pro or a con. I thought it was really cool. It reminds me well, some Dungeons and Dragons, but almost like the Wheel of Time. I get vibes from that. Um, what else? Um, you definitely do have to focus and pay attention. This is not a Star Wars book where it's like, haha, lightsaber go burr. There, there's a lot you have to pay attention to and focus and keep track of. So this is one where you might want to open up the Wikipedia and check for matching up names and places. And then they do have some encyclopedia material in the back, which is helpful too, if you'd like to uh, see a, a more linear way of what you're reading represented. But overall, I really liked this. Another great addition to the Epic Collection. I'm looking forward to volume two. 
And let's see, so the creative team, uh, you'll recognize them from other Star Wars books. Uh, written by John Ostrander and Jan Dersema. Uh, penciler was Jan Dersema. Inkers are Dan Parsons and Jan Dersema. Colorists are Wes Dezova and Jan Dersema. The letterer is Michael Heisler. Um, so Star Wars Legends, Tales of the Jedi, Volume 1 from Marvel. Excellent. All right. Uh, Jim, what you got over there from the DC Universe? I have Generations Shattered. This is a one-shot book. There will be a follow-up book coming out later called Generations Reforged. Um, and this is kind of what was going to be part of the DC universe, but just took a look, completely different turn because politics over there changed things um, company-wide. So, But this is supposedly what's coming out of Dark Knight's Death Metal which is a storyline I have not followed for the most part. But I don't think you really needed to because it takes, it picks up at the end and you didn't need to know anything about what was happening there to begin with to follow it. Because it pretty much is self-explanatory. It opens up with Kamandi, the last boy, and his friend, the tiger, running through, running away from this white goneness they call it and then being also being chased by some creatures they call batmen which are like giant human-sized bats that are chasing them because they believe that the boy and the tiger are responsible for this goneness and at the last moment commandi's rescued by a hand that says come with me and it turns out it is uh old man booster Ooh. Booster Gold, when he's a very much older man, with a gold arm, who is actually his robot Skeets. Ah. Um, and they have to rescue him because he's important to saving time itself. And they are set off on this, this journey through time to rescue the proper people to bet put together a team to save time. And they make all these different stops and sometimes they get the wrong person and sometimes they get somebody they didn't quite expect. And you know they put together the, the team and um, we see like flashes of diff different time periods. Like they just from the 80, 840, what is it? The 853rd century, which was the DC 1 million timeline, uh, the 25th century, where uh, the reverse flash comes from, uh, the time's end, the 80, 64th century, the, th the present, you know, all these different time periods, and all the people that are responsible for watching over time. We have Rip Hunter, we have Wave Rider, you know, all these different characters. They're all monitoring this event. And then uh, they, uh, the wave rider goes and he tries to rescue Booster, but it's too late. Booster is, gives Kamandi his arm so that Kamandi can go and take care of everything. And then Booster's gone. And then, it, but this whole story, it was just like, it was so much fun. It was like, it gave me like the feeling of reading uh, Crisis on Infinite Earth for the first time, although that was a, I think it was a 12 issue stick book there. This was 80, 80 pages. So it kind of like combined all that fun into one. And you get all these glimpses of the different groups and the different time periods, all of them very quick, but they all make sense. And you don't have to overthink anything and just go with it. You know, it's going to be, you know, they finally put together the team and it consists of. Batman from 1939, Superboy from early on in his Legion of Superheroes appearances, uh, uh, Sinestro from when he was still his time period as a Green Lantern, Booster Gold, a younger Booster Gold from when he first appeared in Metropolis in the present, well, back then it was the present time, uh, Starfire from the early days of the Teen Titans when um, 
I think it was probably the Judas contract story when they first encountered Deathstroke. Uh, Dr. Light, the second Dr. Light, the Japanese uh, lady one, um, and who else is in there? Uh, I believe that might have been the entire team they put together. Oh, Steel. Uh, Steel, the Superman fill-in from after the death of Superman, because when they recruited him, they showed this uh, fight between Steel and uh, Cyborg Superman. So this is the team they've got together that is going to save time. And they end up fighting with another team who was, you know, some other people that are in charge of saving time, but they've been influenced by a villain. And so, yeah, it's all big fight battles and great colorful splash pages where you can see all these different characters. and fractured time all these different crystals this was so much fun it was not what i was expecting it's just uh, because you know this was it was supposed to be after uh this dark dark knight's death metal it was supposed to be the generation five was what D dc was headed towards and then that got scrapped so this is how they were going to wrap up all these things that they had out there and combine it into this story. So I'm just, this is kind of cool. It's fun. Was that dinosaur? I'm looking from forward the to the second. Uh, no, it was a dinosaur from out of time. Okay. Um, there was, yeah, they had a Tyrannosaurus Rex. They had a uh, Thrandarian Brontosaur and a Kryptonian Mind Lizard or something, I think it was called. <laughs> All together in one page. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, there you go. <laughs> All right. Good, good. Um, jumping so back. So much fun. Jumping back into the Star Wars uh, universe. I'm no Jedi ambassador, but I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, this here is Star Wars The High Republic. Issue number one, Before the Skywalker Saga, The Golden Age of the Jedi. A new era of Star Wars storytelling begins. It is centuries before the Skywalker Saga. The Jedi are at their height, protecting the galaxy as Republic pioneers uh, push into the new territories. As the frontier prepares for the dedication of the majestic Starlight Beacon, Padawan Keen Trennis faces the ultimate choice. Will she complete her Jedi trials or rescue the innocent from disaster? New Jedi, new ships, new evils to fight. All right. Um, this is part of the. I just want to say, I got this book too. Oh, you did? Uh, oh, I don't hey. usually read Star Wars books, but this one looked interesting and I had to do a reorder. So I picked that one up as well. Nice. And have you read this one, Katie? Yes, sir, I have. Uh, so, yeah, we are following uh, Keeve Trennis, who is our uh, lead character right in the center there. As uh, I, I really, well, A, I ran in the, they give a Star Wars timeline, which I really like, just kind of showing where everything falls with the High Republic, the fall of the Jedi, the reign of the Empire, the Age of Rebellion, the New Republic, and Rise of the First Order. And they have brackets off side of that, just kind of saying where the movies and the television shows all fall into uh, those eras. So it's a pretty cool timeline for anyone that just kind of jumping into this, kind of seeing uh, where it's all connected. Uh, but yeah, this opening scene, I thought it was pretty good as you see uh, what you would assume being a, uh, a battle, uh, but you just find out it is a Jedi training between um, Keeve and her master, who is this uh, lizard looking creature that we see on the, the other side, you know, he is kind of a Kind of has some boskness to him, some Spider-Man lizardness to him. Um, but we see this opening scene, a lot of action, some good comedy. We have some uh, a little side character, if you will, uh, literally, as we have uh, I forget the name of this uh, character here, um, but it's like looks like a little like fly bug type of uh, type of person. But anyways. Um, this opening scene is pretty action packed with the idea of her completing her trials, but there is uh, immediately 
a distraction as all these uh, giant uh, insects come kind of crashing through and kind of leads to uh, a city that uh, is going to be needing some help. So she makes the, the ultimate decision on whether or not to uh, continue on with her trials, trials or help those in need. Um, so that is kind of the test or the, the teaser for that opening scene. Um, kind of what Katie talked about with the last one, the fact that there's uh, really no, you know, no Skywalkers and stuff like that. Uh, same thing with this series here, at least from the first issue. But there is a recognizable character. And uh, for those that uh, it's been out for a couple of weeks now, so I will reveal this because it could be possibly a selling point if somebody didn't really want to jump into a world of uh, characters they didn't really know. But uh, we do see Yoda. Spoil it, you will not. What's that? Spoil it, you will not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, we see Yoda in here, a much younger Yoda. He's probably, what, like 700 here, I think? Um, um, yeah, seven, 700, 600, 700. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, I was it, gonna say it's old Grogu. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought may, maybe it was like even further back, and you were getting to see a baby Yoda, <laughs> actual baby Yoda. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so Yoda is in this book. That could be a selling point for anyone that was on the fence about jumping into a new thing. But uh, um, but yeah, I, I highly enjoyed it. I liked the the pacing, the energy, the humor. Um, this here was written by Kevin Scott, artist by art, art by Ario Anadito. Uh, Mark Morales is the anchor, and Annalisa Leone as the colorist, and Ariana Mayer as the letterer. Um, but yeah, I, I really liked the the high high paced action of this. Really kept me engaged throughout the issue, um, while a lot of it is all kind of new and stuff. You know the yoda of it all being in there was a just a cool little thing just to kind of get some connecting piece there to kind of see where you know this could eventually fit but uh i really like this uh this jedi in training and we'll see her kind of go through these trials and see uh kind of where her character uh takes off from here and uh you'll get some idea of that uh by the end of the first issue but i will just leave it at that um is there anything you uh and you read it, Jim, or you just ordered? I it? did. Okay, I did. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I really liked the ceremony where she gets her promotion, and they cut off that little Padawan braid with a lightsaber, <laughs> just the way you want to get a haircut. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's. Uh, I know the well, last time when I had went to a barber, uh, that's why I stopped going to one and start cutting my own hair because they started busting out lightsabers i'm like i don't even think you're a jedi even a sith i wouldn't trust him, so. um but that was i i actually kind of got a little choked up when you read that ceremony in that page about that you know it was like oh wow cool uh katie any uh, thoughts to add to the, this at all sure Sure. Well, I loved it. Um, it was very fun. It was a nice adventure. I liked that it did tell what I think a number one should do, which is a beginning, middle, and end and sets up for the next one. Um, yeah, I agree. The ceremony was actually really moving. Something I love about the High Republic is we finally get to see the Jedi being the heroes that they really should be. I love that. Um, this was a really good story, good mix of action, um, and it has me hyped for what's coming next. Um, I did read the Light of the Jedi and Test of Courage novels, which are all taking place fairly concurrently with this. So um, that, that just made me actually really enjoy it even more. Like, I don't think you have to have read them to enjoy this book. And if you are someone who likes Star Wars and doesn't read a lot of comics, this is a good one to start with. And if you are someone who likes comics but doesn't read a lot of Star Wars, also a good one to start with. I'm very excited. Kevin Scott. I'm, I'm just really proud of him watching his growth through comics throughout the past few years. And he's got a novel coming up. Um, very proud of that. And yeah, I had a ton of fun. This was, this was just great. Really good comic. Cool. Cool. Well said. And uh, speaking of uh, a lot of fun, great, really cool comics um, available now in trade paperback form is X-Ray Robot, which collects the first four issues of four 
of uh, X-Ray Robot, my Mike and Laura Allred, as well as Nate Pico. So check that out. Uh, that concludes this advertisement. Um, we will move. It was on. how many issues? Uh, four of four. The first four issues of the last four issues, too. Okay. Four of four. Um, David, uh, your next title. All right. So uh, next up, I have um, Assassins, which um, looking at the front cover, I mean, you, you can guess a little bit of. Uh, who, who's mixed together here a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to tell a little bit until you really start uh, seeing. And this, uh, this is a comic book where the sort of fictional backstory here is that this is a team up book between two other characters uh, that, that supposedly had their own um, other books and now they're kind of coming together in this, this ongoing team up book that only has one issue. Um, so you've got Dare, who is a mashup of um, Daredevil and Deathstroke. Um, but they then also decided to make it a woman. So um, so you've got, uh, I think Slade Murdoch is the other name, but uh, the <laughs> character's name is Dare. Um, you know, not really sure about the eye patch because she's blind anyways. You know, I guess she just likes wearing the eye patch over one of the eyes. Um, and then you have cat sigh, you know, cat sigh. There's, there's a good pun there for Eric who <laughs> should have been here. <laughs> He's missing out. Yeah. So, um, so this character is, um, is cat woman and Electra kind of merged together. Um, so the story here in this, uh, issue is they're killing off, uh, another mixed character, uh, Deadeye, who's a, a mix of Bullseye and Deadshot, um, is they have been hired, um, for, for a job. And so have, they have to make their way through, uh, Arkham Tower, which, is this huge building in New Gotham that was built where Arkham Asylum used to be. And um, I don't really understand the point of them having built this tower because apparently they thought it would cost too, mu too much money to relocate the, the, you know, all these crazy criminals who lived in Arkham Asylum. So they're still in Arkham Tower I, I don't know. They don't really go uh, too heavily into explaining that. Um, I think they just wanted to have them, you know, going through these levels of essentially Arkham Asylum, you know. And uh, so they're after the mayor. Um, and the mayor in this case, you know, everybody knows is, is a corrupt, bad guy. Um, it's Mayor Enigma Fisk. So we have a mashup of the Riddler and Kingpin, uh, or in this case, he's known as the Big Question. And uh, let's... King, Kingpin, who would later go off to be the mayor in the Marvel Universe, right? And this, this is before then, but um, see if I can get a good uh, big question. There, there are some better ones, but the first one I flip to there is, you know, so there's this big guy with a big question mark tattooed on his white bleached face. <laughs> and, uh, so otherwise he's kind of the build of uh of kingpin and he'll ask these little riddles i guess um periodically so um basically they're, they're going through and he's sending all these people after them as they're trying to get up the tower to him um so you see uh, a number of them like you said he had uh dead eye and then you have um, this character who they don't really go into a lot of explanations. It kind of looks like um, a cross between um, what's name Wonder Woman villain, uh, Cheetah, Cheetah and um, and Craven the Hunter is kind of kind of mixed together there, um, and they go through and basically 
the whole comic is them just fighting their way to him, um, talking about how you know they've been hired by this mysterious person. They don't know who hired him to go after the big question. And um, so for anybody interested, I won't spoil it and say, you know, the reveal as to who hired them and why they hired them. Um, but I, I will say it seems to have the death of one of these characters in it, even though this is supposed to be an ongoing uh, team up book between the two of them. So you have to ask yourself, well, if it's a team up book, how can this one character actually be dead? I guess we'll have to wait until issue two. Oh, wait a minute. There is no issue two. Hmm. Um, this one is written by D.G. Ch Chichester. It's C-H-I-C-H-E-S-T-R. So it sounds like you're stuttering Chester. Uh, Scott McDaniel is the penciler. Derek Fisher, the inker. Ken Lopez, letterer. Pat Guerreri, colorist. Eddie Braganza is the associate editor. And Kevin Dooley is the editor. This is published by... DC Comics. Um, so this one really is kind of a mixture. It's a little bit difficult to tell, um, to really pick out that there's more of a DC or more of a Marvel feel. Um, I felt that overall it, it almost had a little bit more of a Marvel feel actually. Um, but, uh, but of course, that is a DC comic. So, um, you know, th this isn't the, the team up that I would typically read. I still found it to be a little bit interesting. I think uh, this would also be another uh, another one that you know I'd think that someone like Eric, with his taste and whatever, would have uh, would have liked a uh, comic like this. So uh, once again, Eric has missed out. He's uh, he's kicking himself right now. I bet. Yes, right it's now. It's called ass ass. A ass ass ins. <laughs> oh. All right, uh, let's jump to Kirby for the next one. All right, I picked up uh, a little packet of Madman items. I don't didn't know if there was a correlation with it or not, but I just grabbed them because I wanted this one for sure, which is a little small, the Ashcan comic. And it's uh, basically Madman goes on a vacation with Dr. Flem. And he keeps hearing and experiencing a bunch of strange things that cause him to feel like he's having a dream. And he just keeps searching around for what's causing the noise and stuff and keeps having these images of him and Joe and all that stuff. But you follow Madman and all is a nice little, this is a newer, newer Madman comic. So he's got more of his powers and stuff and he's in his little, white and red suit with the yellow lightning bolt so it's basically 1993 is when this came out but then it also came with Madman number one the image first redone and this one has a device that can uh that they use dr flam uses to put recorded memories back into madman's head and when he does, he ends up having tons of different images, starts seeing a bunch of stuff, and starts messing, all the memories start messing with his head, and he gets all confused, and then he goes back to time where early times with him and Joe when they first met and stuff, and <laughs> Dr. Biofard, the other doctor in here, I mean, this guy's just having a ball throughout multiple issues but he keeps injecting himself with this serum that's supposed to expand his brain and as you can see his brain is there's earlier versions and this is him where his brain's kind of like bulging out and taking over uh, you get to see a lot of stuff with Joe and him in the early days which is nice to catch up on all that stuff. And then the, there's a UFO that crashes while they're enjoying a picnic and they chase that down and try and find out what's up with it, run into an alien. And the alien causes a bunch of issues with people around him and stuff. And then he 
runs into some beatniks and the beatniks end up having some issue from some pink goo that got gets on them and you come across the people that Joel works with who are kind of like evil jackasses that just like to pick on madman and just it was a very fun story to go back to and get the early times a madman and then for some reason the next one jumps you all the way over to atomic comics number six which and number 10 actually number six and ten which madman deals with a creature that's absorbing people and that he's working with the rest of the gang i don't know all these different characters all their names and stuff that he works with from the atomic comics because i'm too new to this and i can't think of all the names right offhand but this creature just appears and uh, starts absorbing characters and you're like what the hell they're just basically getting all killed off but they end up going to this i don't know another realm or whatever <laughs> and uh, they just have a bunch of strange adventures with this, the aliens and stuff and a bunch of weird things keep happening. The one character basically gets his <laughs> alien tentacles that get, go into his eyeball slots and it, it's like a brain sucking type of creature and stuff. But, but yeah, these are fun. They kind of all link together. So I don't know. I want to read all the ones in between all of them and get to find out more about those. But <laughs> it's fun seeing him with his issues with beatniks and all that stuff. <laughs> but yeah, the time of comics, this is basically my newer introduction to him. I got a bunch of them, but I just haven't got into them yet. So yeah, this was a fun little set that I just picked up cheap and just they just work together nicely. So. Cool, cool. And uh, speaking of like Madman, that was created by Mike Allred, who uh, currently has X-Ray Robot out as a trade paperback. Um, four issues. Uh, that's number one. Also issue number two. It uh, includes issue number three and uh, also has issue number four. So all four of those issues in one binding trade paperback, Dark Horse Comics. Check it out. Yeah, like one of those uh, one of those little mini series where like the first couple issues are, are pretty good, and then and around three you're like, why am I even reading this? And then four yeah. picks back up, and it just yeah. yeah, it's definitely like a sleeper issue where they're just like, okay, yeah, we just have to go through this until we get to the actual good stuff. So, and if it wasn't for Laura Allred, these pictures would be very boring and black and white. So Gotta maybe they'll talk. republish it without number three in there. Ooh, that's a good idea, actually. It'd make the story better. <laughs> Agreed. Um, so we're going to move on to uh, back to the DC Universe uh, over with Jim for your next title as I buy a little time for you to take your swig for the working man. All right. Well, it's not going to be a title. It is going to be nine titles. The Endless Winter Storyline. This was uh, something that had been talked about coming out. It was going to be a big thing. I knew that, um, and I planned on getting all the issues. So when the previews came out, I went through the catalogs, and I looked, okay, Justice League, Endless Winter. Superman, Endless Winter Special. Uh, Justice League, Normal Storyline, Endless Winter. I get that anyway. Teen Titans, Endless Winter Special. Uh, Black Adam, Endless Winter Special. And then ending up with Justice League, Endless Winter Part 2. So I start reading it. And uh, just you know, the Justice League, End Endless Winter. And it says, to be continued in the Flash 767. Nowhere in the catalog did they ever say that Splash 767 was going to be part of this storyline. So I went back and I reordered Splash 767, waited till I came, 
and then find out that in the meantime, uh, Justice League Endless Winter, or let's see what, our Superman Endless Winter comes in and it says it's part three. And I also received Teen Titans, no, not Teen, whatever is it, part four. Oh, here it is, part five. Just the regular Justice League, and it says part five. Okay, so I've got part one, part two I ordered, part three came in, part five came in, where's part four? I, then I decided, okay, I'm going to look up and see what is the reading order for these, and I find out Aquaman 66 was part four. Again, nothing that was ever said to be in uh, any of the catalogs to be part of the Endless Winter storyline. So I was like, okay, we'll, we'll go through it. And it's like, and it ends up, there is one more that I had to go back and reorder, and that was Justice League Dark number 29, which was number seven. So at this time, I have to say, okay, I'm going to wait until I get all of them before I continue reading any of this. So basically, I read number one, waited until I got them all, and then read the whole thing all at once, pretty much. And it was, it turns out that that was a good way to do it, because I don't think I would have enjoyed it as much if I had waited a month, 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 and, and read it as, it as they were coming, you know, that way. But this turns out, it, and it was actually a very good story where um, it's, it starts um, back in the 10th century where um, Queen Hippolyta and uh, Black Adam and a uh, former incarnation of the Avatar of the Green, a former Swamp Thing, and a character that I'm not familiar with, I don't know if he was just created for this or somebody I just missed, called uh, the Viking Prince, uh, who is an immortal Viking who cannot die until something heroic happens to him, are called together to fight this creature called the Frost King. And um, he is a another Viking who for some reason, he is a metahuman who at the time was rare and he has the power of el elementally controlling winter or cold and storms and such. And he's not able to deal with it and he loses control of it and sets loose winter on every the whole world basically at the time. And uh, th those four are called together, brought together to fight against him um, and Black Adam being who Black Adam is, he doesn't care about anybody. So, and he ends up uh, using the man's family against him and basically drives him crazy, you know, and, but eventually they do stop this man, winter stop, things go back to normal until uh, 10 centuries later. Something happens. Um, David, maybe you'll know about this, but something happened to Superman's Fortress of Solitude, and it's gone from where it was, had been. You know? And there's this big hole in the Arctic where the for Fortress of Solitude used to be, and now Sebastian Stagg is uh, digging there for Kryptonian crystals, and he sets this Frost King free from this frozen prison and he starts to basically starts his rampage over and everything starts freezing again and uh, the Justice League has to stop him and they find need to go to Queen Hippolyta and get the story of what happened in the past and they end up having to recruit Black Adam to re help them out again and go through the basically the same events and but this time they do it right and they save the man in the process so yeah that was a fun story to read that to see the time travel back and forth between them and, and like i said um i highly recommend waiting until the whole story comes out before you read it and try to read instead of trying to read it out of order uh in in response to the fortress of solitude thing um, I, I'm trying to remember 
most currently what's what's going on with the Fortress of Solitude. I mean, throughout various versions and stuff like that, the, the Fortress of Solitude has been destroyed, rebuilt, relocated, um, and, and different things. So where they are at, at this point, I'm not sure just off the top of my head. Well, at the end of this storyline, uh, they Superman was rebuilding the Fortress of Solitude on the previous site just for to protect, pro, protect it from any of these lost Kryptonian crystals getting found by anybody else. But I did not know that it had been gone. So apparently, it has yeah. again. But nine issue story. Um, could have been done in six. So they like, I think they ended up having to um, threw in a couple of extra stories that they didn't need to. Unfortunately, the That's ones that they the didn't. Yeah, the, but unfortunately, the ones that weren't advertised as part of the story, you kind of didn't need to have those. Um, so it could have been like a couple of the other issues they could, could have like condensed the story down into something else, but Overall, yeah, it was it was very very worth picking up. If they do a trade paperback of it in the next few, in the near future, uh, yeah, if you're a big fan of the Justice League and you're a big fan of alternate versions of the Justice League, you get to see a good portion of each book deals with the 10th century version of basically the Justice League. So that's good to see that. Well, cool. Um, you had said uh, trade paperback, which uh, leads me to talk about X-Ray Robot, um, which is available in trade paperback format. Um, issues one through four are collected in here in one binding trade paperback X-Ray Robot. Will they issue a trade paperback having issue number five in there? Uh, if they do, I will talk about it on here. I will make sure to mention it at least once. All right. Um, my last title or titles, if you will, is uh, much like Jim was talking about several different things. I'm going to talk about Future State. Now, I did end up getting more than I thought I uh, wanted for Future State, uh, mostly because of the uh, delayed and canceled Wonder Woman 84 movie variant covers. Um, without my knowledge, I uh, got thrown into the Future State issues which got me to buy comics I really wasn't going to buy. Uh, future State, uh, stories taking place in a, a future state, if you will, um, uh, post-death metal, much like what Jim was saying, um, that I, I would agree that these stories are all uh, very easy, easy to uh, come into without having read this uh, recent death metal, which I haven't. Uh, the triumph victory of our heroes saves uh, all reality from the brink of destruction and shakes loose the very fabric of space and time. From the ashes of death metal rises new life or infinite multiverse and glimpses into the possible unwritten worlds of tomorrow. Um, so the ones I'm going to highlight are the ones I actually did want and actually enjoyed more than the ones I just bought for the Wonder Woman cover. Uh, talking about uh, future state, uh, Wonder Woman, um, I gotta look because these titles are like all over the place. I think this is just Future State Wonder Woman. Yep, number one. Um, I did have to get two covers, not only because, uh, you know, uh, actually I think it got three covers of this one with the Wonder Woman 84, but Joelle Jones uh, her, got her cover and Jenny Frizen, two of my top favorites. So um, I couldn't pick. Uh, or choose between one of them, so I got both of them. Uh, Joelle Jones and Jordi Belair, Clayton Cowles, uh, great creative team I love on here. Dealing with Yara Flor, who is uh, from uh, an Amazon rainforest in Brazil, who is Wonder Woman. We just kind of dive right into it. Um, this is a fun adventure um, where basically she's on a, on a task, on a mission to get uh, some horns off of this beast in uh, possibly to help save a family member. I think she might use that. Uh, I don't know if it's to, to bargain or if it's part of some ritual. That's part of a story I've got to read yet. Um, but uh, it kicks off with some action. Really digging the art here. Um, 
beautiful colors. This team is the team is what really sold me, and the character was just a combination of everything I love. But you see her kind of battling through. It's pretty pretty gruesome throughout uh, this first issue here with some battles, but coming across somebody that uh, is basically going to help her get to where she needs to go in order to uh, uh, help save this family member. But Yara Floor is a new character that uh, I think is already being developed for a CW show, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so yeah, they're fast tracking this character. I'm not sure what uh, her involvement is going to be within the greater DC universe beyond this, but uh, this first issue really did bring her to my attention, and I think I will follow, uh, see where she goes from here. Um, Future State Swamp Thing is out as well. Um, this is dealing with the world where basically humans and the, the plant people, the people of the green are basically separated to where they both kind of almost understand that the that the opposite party is um, is kind of a myth. So, like the, the the humans are just like, oh, we heard the tale of the you know the swamp people, but we haven't seen them, and vice versa with the humans. Uh, but this story kind of collides with the fact that uh, one of the humans is caught in, catching himself in uh, self defense and kills one of the members of the green, and that kind of brings the 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 green to hunt down where these humans are and uh, kind of leads to an interesting sit down between this version of Swamp Thing. Um, basically, anytime you read Swamp Thing, you know, there probably just gets very deep and philosophical on, you know, he's no longer Alec Holland, the man, but the, the green has overtaken him and, and he's, you know, doesn't have any memories of him. He doesn't recognize himself as Alec Holland. You still have those kind of vibes in this comic. So, but anytime I read Swamp Thing, it's always kind of gives me that uh, introduction to the fact that, you know, this might not just be that guy that was blown up in that uh, explosion in the bayou back way back when. And dealing with this being a future state one, I've pretty much come to terms that this is just, uh, you know, another person of the green that uh, looks like Swamp Thing and talks in orange and black word balloons like Swamp Thing does. But if it's Alec Holland, that's still left to be decided If uh, unless I missed that in the story. But the art is pretty good. This one here is uh, done by, uh, hold on here, uh, Ram V is the writer. Mike Perkins does the art as well as June Chung uh, and the great colors here. And uh, Adita beat a car on the letters but for a Swamp Thing book it has everything you would uh, expect a very familiar sense that Wonder Woman book was very while the action and stuff was very familiar in the sense of Wonder Woman but the characters were very new uh, in this future state enjoyable but not as recognizable as you would for a Swamp Thing so I think if you're a Swamp Thing fan this is probably something that you're gonna probably be picking up and enjoying um um, I, I will put in, um, you're mentioning, was it Alec Holland or not? Um, I had read something in sort of the, the advertising, these interstate books and talking about the different characters and stuff. I can't remember the name, but there was a different name given in, in this uh, information uh, yeah. as being a new swamp thing. So... I mean, if it reads like Swamp Thing, maybe it doesn't matter all that much uh, who it actually is, but um, that's the information that had been put out. Um, whether that's accurate or not, I, I can't swear to it, but it sounds like it is actually supposed to be someone different. And I've always said, if it looks like a Swamp Thing and smells like a Swamp Thing, it's probably a Swamp Thing. So, But yeah, it does oh, very oh, much. It's a man thing. <laughs> yeah. I, I um, think I had a Swamp Thing in the toilet earlier. <laughs> um let me figure out how to transition into future state Kara zor superwoman issue number one uh pretty awesome uh, cover there to kick it off this uh is a team of marguerites and that is one of my drawing points uh in addition to the fact that this is supergirl who is now superwoman in this future state but uh marguerite bennett and uh marguerite savage are the creative team on here um 
So that alone will sell me a book. And this is basically uh, Kara, who is living on uh, a society on the moon. It's basically a, uh, a safe place for people, uh, for outcasts and refugees to come and live. And uh, you just kind of, you get thrown right into the story of the fact that there is a ship that crash lands on the moon and it's uh, a character walks out right here on the first uh, credits page. Um, this alien creature who herself was outcast from her own family. She's being chased by her ancestors for powers that were uh, basically given to her that they feel they need to take from her. So she comes into here uh, crash landing kind of gets in a, a, a little tussle with uh, Kara in the beginning until they kind of realize that they're both kind of almost very similar. And that's kind of what the story is dealing with the fact that uh, Kara and this other character, uh, I think like Iani or Ilali or something, got some kind of alien name that I didn't memorize yet. Um, um, sorry to interrupt. I am looking at the time and I'm going to have to head out. So uh, I didn't want to just disappear and where David was. Um, yeah, it is that time that I got to go. So um, um, I'm expecting to be gone about half an hour. This may or may not be finished by the time I get back. Um, if not, I'll see you uh, later. And uh, if I get uh, back in time, you know, I will uh, wrap things up. So otherwise. All right, David. All right. See you later. Bye. And, that was, and that bought me great time to find uh, Linari is the name of the character. Um, but ultimately, this issue is dealing with the fact that this Linari character is caught in a very similar situation that Kara Zorial was once caught in in the original story of Supergirl and the fact that they relate based on uh, being outcast and how they were treated with their families and what's expected out of them and things like that. And uh, she requires the help. Uh, she asked for the help of uh, this character um, in order to help build their society here on the moon. But what's interesting is that the Lenari character while she has done something positive for the people on the moon here, she's a little perturbed the fact that uh, they're not really thanking her for her generosity. And she gets kind of hostile at the fact that they're not praising her for her help. She's kind of helping uh, put up this dam, uh, build this dam here in, in this uh, world. And uh, so that kind of sets her off into an interesting uh, situation. But once again, her family, her ancestors are the one that are basically trying to track her down. And it's going to be, uh, after you read this issue, it's basically going to be Supergirl and uh, this character, Lenari, going to have to basically kind of team up and put some of their, even though they share a lot of similarities, currently some of their differences are kind of putting them aside, uh, putting them apart. But, uh, but yeah, I thought this one was pretty fun too. Uh, once again, if you just know the basic you know, premise of, you know, who Supergirl is as a character and not having read any of the death metal stuff. I'm just thrown into this mix and uh, I seem to be catching up pretty, pretty easily. And I think the ones I'm getting are might be two issues. Some of the other Batman and Superman titles might be twice monthly, but uh, I got the first issues of those because of those variant covers, but uh, they didn't really intrigue me enough. So I'm going to be, uh, checking it out uh these ones out further and the last one from dc future state is harley quinn um this one i believe the creative team is the one that's taking over um stephanie phillips is the the new writer for this one here simone uh demed tamara bonvillain and uh uh troy pateri uh, for the creative team I think this is the team that's jumping onto the new Harley book coming out in March. Uh, but this is uh, Harley basically uh, being questioned. She's in a prison state. She is being questioned by somebody known as Jonathan Crane, but uh, he is not dressing up as the scarecrow in the series. You just see him as his human form and the story kind of goes in depth of why he's presenting himself in this manner. But the reason why he's got, Harley Quinn tied up uh, throughout this issue is basically he needs her help, needs information on tracking down these other villain, villains in Gotham City. Uh, we see some Professor Pig in here. We see some Firefly and the, uh, the Black Mask Gang. 
our three villains that we're kind of dealing with and the fact that there's a whole book full of villains and the fact that uh uh scarecrow or jonathan is uh um or uh was it steve is that what he called himself in the in the uh archimaniacs is that what it was i think it was i think he just he just referred to as steve now so but anyways uh that's a whole different continuity um but yeah it, it's interesting of seeing scarecrow you know seeking out harley for the help on on this and figure out where that goes from here but this was a good uh, preview if anything for the art style um and the tone of uh what we could expect in the uh the new ongoing starting in March, but uh, figured I'd give it a shot and thought all these were pretty fun here. Um, the other ones I'm not going to follow through on that. Uh, so, yeah. Um, were those all single story books? These ones that I just talked about, I think are two issues a piece. And the ones I'm not. No, but gonna... I mean, in, in each book, is there only one story? In these ones, yes. So I also okay. read The Dark Detective, which was a double price book and i didn't know it but there's a whole second story that is about i think red hood and robin honestly i just paid i was so bored by the end of it so i didn't go through the rest of it okay that was one i of have the that one i haven't read it yet um i have read uh, the next batman book that's the first one i've read that's on my pile and, and that one has actually three stories in it um and the main story is written by john ridley um oh. So that one, that one was interesting. Um, I was just wondering what you think as far as future state, how far in the future do you feel it is? I, I don't think I could get a sense of that based on reading these. And I may have read, I don't know if it was a simple thing like 50 years later. I don't know if it's as simple as that. I mean, you know, it's hard to tell in a comic book world because, you know, it's not old lady Harley or anything, but, you know, 50 years in their time, you know, you think you would see them older um but harley well, uh, harley should be the easiest one to gauge by but yeah yeah the other ones you're not going to tell uh based on the ones i read but based on harley here the only thing that looks futuristic is looking like a fifth element kind of world with the art style and stuff like that but it's still you know i think that's just the colors and the art that's brought to it but her herself she looks like normal harley so honestly i have no clue <laughs> and the stories just... haven't told me of like in 2079 when, yeah, the, yeah. the only character i could really go by in that one in the, the next batman was the luke fox character and he is still a youngish man he's not an old man so it's hard to yeah it was hard to say how far it went so yeah um but yeah those are ones i uh, really dug and uh but yeah uh excited to kind of check out the second issues of those and to see if uh if any of those themes and characters most likely yarrow floor are kind of going beyond the future state and most likely you know possibly getting her own series beyond this too but we'll see um cool so yeah that's just kind of my thoughts on dc future state from the stuff that i read and because david had to jump out he had our last title uh, anyone else kirby did you have any final thing to Okay, then we are going to wrap it up for the weekly reviews. We have one final segment, which is going to be our letters page. Shelly just handed me. I didn't realize she got these, but Katie at the dollar store, she only paid a buck for these. Hey, that's cool. What are they? Thank uh, you. Uh, well, I hope you have uh, fun coloring. Up to do in there, so. I brought extra things. Very nice. <laughs> she even bought extras. <laughs> Aww. Those are cool. I hope you have fun coloring. Thank you for showing them to me. They usually you pay 15, 20 bucks for these coloring books nowadays. Right? I've never paid that much for a coloring book. Well, I haven't bought any, but I'm <laughs> just going by the prices I see. <laughs> yeah, the most I spent was just recently with the Bowie one that the All Reds did. Uh, they did the, the coloring book version of that. Uh, and speaking of the All Reds, even though we're not recording on audio right now, but there's a trade paper. Oh, <laughs> that's yeah, just a black and white comic, Anthony. Oh, is it? <laughs> okay, but for real, you know those Ultimate Collections Marvel put out a while ago that are black and white. Like those would be the most epic coloring books ever. 
See, and that's what uh, you could do in the, the Turtles one with all the, the original black and go. white. And I had said that uh, when my buddy Sean was on here that uh, when he was young, he colored right into those puppies. And uh, Kurt was cringing, you know, even though he yeah. was on the podcast, but he was like, ah. Because, yeah, I know me and David would always uh, tease about, like, if he had had, he had his turtle books there. And then we're just like, hey, those uh, look like they could use a little color. Yeah. We love you, Kurt. We miss you. <laughs> He's never hearing this. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, recording audio. Okay. Get my screens back in order. Okay. Here we go. <clears throat> Welcome to the letters page, everybody. This is our final segment of the show. Uh, our uh, question that is brought to us this week, pick a comic book character you never had much interest in, but assign the writer and the artist that would get you to read their series. All right. I'm going to kick it off with Green Lantern. Green Lantern is a character I've read just sporadically, whether he showed up in uh, some of the other stories I was reading or in that Silver Surfer crossover issue. But uh, I've tried a couple of Green Lantern number ones and character that I just, even though I like like Marvel Cosmic and things like that, I never got that uh, deep into the cosmic realm when it came to DC Comics. So I figured if I saw a Green Lantern brand new number one on the shelf, and if it was written by Kelly Thompson, who's a superstar writer over at Marvel right now, done some independent work with uh, Sabrina as well as her own work. But uh, I think uh, she could bring the good flavor of humor into that. That would really draw like my, you know, what I'm drawn to. And speaking of drawing, I think the great uh, Fiona Staples, who is most famous for Saga, would definitely do, uh, she would have to tone down her, uh, the graphic of, uh, of her images that she would do in a Green Lantern book, unless it's Black Label. Um, Cause yeah, she's definitely not doing her saga artwork uh, uncensored in a, in a Green Lantern book, but I think she's got the chops for that and you pair that with some humor and throw a Green Lantern there. I think uh, that's definitely a book I would pick up off the shelf and be like, I'm at least reading the first arc. So that is my choice. I think this is why David created this uh, excuse of leaving because uh sometimes you know he'll think about you know answers some of the questions and he's probably going to hear and see this later when he goes through editing and everything uh so i don't want to call him up but i'm just want to you know maybe be a little suspicious but uh maybe he can plug in his answer if he's got one um kirby what's your answer all right i got a couple ways i went with this i went a family friendly and a just fun normal one and I didn't pick a distinct character because I would take anything from either of my choices coming up, anything they've done with any character, good, bad, whatever. But if I had to pick some of the characters that I haven't been thrilled with that I'd like to see a whole reimagining, reworking done with these people or whatever, it would be people like Aquaman, Hawkeye, Superman, David. <laughs> Wonder Woman, Captain America, Fantastic Four, Sabretooth, Spider-Ham. It's like, those are the ones I'd like to see read works done on and stuff. But Art and Franco could do anything family-friendly with any character out there. I'd love to, I will buy anything they do. But the other one combination I'd love to see done would be Michael Allred doing all the artwork on any of the <laughs> characters. And Alan Martin doing the writing. He's the co-creator of Tank Girl. And with his whole King Tank Girl and everything that's coming out now, I think he's really advanced his writing to a more enjoyable uh, point. And I'd love to see these two collaborate with any type of character. Even though I'd love to see a Squirrel Girl done with a Australian writer's depiction. It's like, but yeah, it's... I could use either of those combinations it would make me very, very, very happy. <laughs> cool, cool. Good choices. Uh, Katie, what you got? Okay. So for me, a character that I just don't have a lot of interest in is Captain Marvel um, from Marvel, not Shazam. So Captain Marvel. And 
I would like, well, I guess I should explain it as that this character, especially Laylee, is so polarizing. Like, you either have to absolutely hate it, it's the worst thing ever, or you have to love it and, like, nothing else. And I'm like, well, well can I have a little nuance? And also, can, can I just have the opportunity to try it and then decide what I think about it? Because, like, it's a character that's been around for a while and different interpretations, you know, people might think different things about it. So I don't feel like it's fair to write off the character as all good or all bad. So something that would make me try Captain Marvel would be if we put, ooh, that's a horrible echo. Um, <laughs> Daniel Warren Johnson on the art, like if he had like the kind of freedom he had with Wonder Woman Dead Earth, I think that would be really cool. I'd love to see what he would do with it. That would definitely lean to more like the darker edge of the character. But I feel like if you put Daniel Warren Johnson on that book, I would read it and not just because he's become kind of a meme around our club. He is actually good at what he does. Um, and then my second choice would be Chris Claremont writing and the Simonsons doing the drawing and editing. So um, if Walt Simonson drew that and then Louise... I, I'm sorry, I just got interrupted by my family. Um, if Louise was doing the editing, I think that would be really fun. So Daniel Warren Johnson or Claremont and Simonson's on Captain Marvel. Danny can get the best of both worlds if you have that creative team and Daniel Warren Johnson's doing the covers. That, oh, that's a fantastic idea. There we go. That's awesome. Okay, I love that. Yeah, <laughs> but that, that would make me pick up Captain Marvel. Cool, cool, cool. All right, Jim, what you got? All right, bear with me a second because my head set you aside, so I got to go back and forth between volume or mic, or you get okay. that echo. <laughs> In the meantime, I do want to let people know. All right, get back. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, I didn't have a lot of time to think about any specific character, but I'm thinking I would pick a character that I like, but I don't read a lot, and I'm thinking Spider Man. I just don't read Spider-Man, um, I, but I do like Spider-Man, so that's strange. But um, And to put a writer that would actually make me want to read it, I'm thinking uh, Tom King. I, I th Right now, I think I loved his Batman run. Uh, I've liked a lot of other things he's written. Um, I would read, if Tom King were going to write Spider-Man, I would definitely give it a shot. And as far as art, um, an artist that could, and not necessarily the, this artist with that writer, but um, Maria Lovett, if she were to do a superhero book, I think that would be interesting. I think she's got this way of just, it's just like a very, even when it's not outright erotic, it's sexy, right? You know, style, putting things together. I mean, she's written teenage books, you know, and it's not erotic, but there's a sexiness about it that's, you know, appropriate. And I think that would be interesting to see in a superhero story. Cool. cool. Um, I can grant uh, your wish partly with the Tom King Spider-Man because in his vision uh, series, he actually kind of geeked out that he had a chance to finally write Spider-Man and the dialogue he wrote, which might be Spider-Man's only dialogue in this series in an action scene with the Avengers is uh, Spider-Man down here um, on this panel. He goes, ah, poop. So uh, there you go. You got your Tom King Spider-Man right there. So um, more of that I'm down for it too. So. All right, um, and uh, well, that's going to be it. I was thinking I had somebody that phoned in their answers, but uh, not this week. Okay, so that is going to do it for this issue of uh, the Crimson Call Comic Club. Next week, we will do crossover issue number three. Uh, we will talk about that one, and then in the coming weeks, we will have the wrap-up for Batman. The adventures continue. Um, with issue number eight and we'll have many more uh comic reviews coming at you if you subscribe to us here at crimson cowl comics on itunes and spotify and 
over on YouTube to catch the video versions. Uh, Kirby has his podcast under the call of MS. You can subscribe to that wherever you get your podcast and more. Um, we have under the call, uh, which is uh, our Wednesday show of just kind of some, you know, not comic specific, more kind of some random chatting about uh, basically whatever. Uh, that one's a little more for the adult crowd. Um, so we got a lot of different content you can check out. Um, and that will do it for this issue of the Crimson Cowl Comic Club. This entire time, um, I've been a proud papaya. I've been a psychedelic beatnik on mind-enhancing drugs. I'm a TA at the Jedi Academy. No. To be continued. Uh, Kirby Starfire <laughs> uh, yeah the mask will come off and we see it's the cat yeah you can tell by the eyes <laughs> Meow. no it's not the cat <laughs> wow we should uh, use that as the picture while we're just talking. We never cut to our video. It's just constantly on that with our dialogue. So, <laughs> I had to say hi. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I don't know how to do that. I'm going to have to save that because now anytime that Shelly is talking, <laughs> I'm going to have to like put this on there. And Hello. that's Shelly now. Perfect. I don't know how to make there more than one person. Ah, there we go. Oh, now. Okay, now we can go with Shelly. Kirby will be back soon. Shelly's iPad is truly Shelly's iPad in this episode. I feel like gold dust from wrestling. <laughs> you can stay there and do the whole podcast. <laughs> no, that's okay. This thing is hot. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>